Uh, it's a Wednesday, and so for the next two Wednesdays, we'll meet in here. Brother Jamie is meeting with uh, the leadership there to kind of walk through what they're going to be responsible for, what they're doing. And then I think, uh, I think next week, we'll kind of let out. He'll contact those that maybe are going to be involved in it further. Um, I think we're talking about either this Sunday or next Sunday, uh, those that are going to be helping in the different ministries there. Uh, he'll keep you afterwards on a Sunday morning uh, it's just for a little bit and kind of walk through what, what it's going to look like, what we need to have done. Uh, it's great to have you everybody here, and uh, I'm so thankful, grateful um, to be back in the Lord's house and to get a chance to study the Word of God with you today. Uh, those that have been in Brother Jamie's class, our class is a little bit different. Uh, hopefully you got a study sheet when you came in. Uh, if anybody need one, didn't get a study sheet, oh, we've got a couple people. We can grab them in just a second. I'll, when they come back in, Scott comes back in, I'll let you know to raise your hand again. Did you get a prayer bulletin as well, or do you need one of those? All right. Well, we'll start off with the, uh, the prayer request, and then I'm going to pray for them publicly rather than breaking up into small groups right now. Uh, so I want to let you uh, take a look at your prayer bulletin. Uh, one of the things I wanted to mention, I haven't mentioned this to anybody, I just found out today. Uh, New Life Baptist Fellowship was a church that we were going to go and have a service with them today, or not today, but this this month, uh, on the 23rd, I think it was. Uh, the pastor contacted me, and it's not going to be a good time for them right now. He had told me that was the perfect one, and then uh, I was nervous about even mentioning it on Sunday, and as soon as I did, three days later, the rug got pulled out. So we're, we're not going to meet with them right now. They've got to, they're talking with their leadership and doing some different things. Lord willing, we'll still do that here in the future. I do want it understood for those that are here, those that are watching online, it is not, we're not merging with them. I had a couple people kind of contact me like nervous about this. No, nothing is moving fast, okay? We're just more or less trying to figure out where does the Lord want us to be. Truthfully, I'm treating this, uh, if we end up having the meeting now, uh, just two sister churches getting together and fellowshipping. And among the Baptist church, that's tough to do. <laughs> Baptists don't get along with anybody. And uh, unfortunately, uh, so I was excited just to get to know their their congregation. Uh, I've been out to eat with her, his with their pastor and his wife and Brenda and I. And we had a fantastic time, and uh, just good people. They're just really good people, and so they're only about four and a half miles away from us here. So uh, it's good to be able to fellowship with them. But continue to pray. Uh, we are continuing to search uh, for a new building, as well as uh, I met with our realtor today, Dustin Amerson. Some of you may know him. Uh, but I met with him for quite a while today and sent a counter proposal back to them. Uh, so we're kind of going back and forth. But right now we don't have a contract on this, so they're itching now to get us under contract. But truthfully, they, we, we, we're waiting to see a few things that kind of work in our favor. So just continue to pray for that. It's a big thing on my prayer request right now. So if you pray, pray for the new building, but pray for your pastor's sanity as well at the same time. A um, number of other things that are on here. Uh, Brother Rollin was moved to Mary Freebed, and so we're thankful for that. I think I left my coffee somewhere. All right. I got some water here. I'll be good. Sorry about that. I take a number of medicines for my heart since I had open heart surgery, and uh, they make me... Uh, dry mouth every once in a while so apologize for that um once again brother rollin is is into mary free bed now and that's a better place for him to be so that's a praise that's an answer to prayer uh, before they didn't have room for him now they have room for him and he can get the care that he needs uh, so we're thankful for that um other than that once again just basically our normal in the church that continued to need prayer support uh, i would also ask that um uh, we continue to pray for our offerings. Offerings have been steady here this last month or so. Uh, the economy as well as uh, the recession, I think we're slipping into very quickly. Uh, it's making it hard for a lot of churches right now. So just make that a matter of prayer. I've always believed this. As your pastor, I don't worry about the money. It's not my money. <laughs> okay? It's his money. And my Bible still says that my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory. Not according to my riches or your riches, his riches. And so whenever I come to the Lord with it, when I'm praying over this, praying about the finances, I just say, Lord, bring in good laborers who are willing to support the work. And uh, if God has your heart, he also has your pocketbook. So I just encourage you to continue to give faithfully. Uh, 
but uh, our building fund expansion fund is up to almost $61,000. Praise the Lord for that. Uh, we need to probably triple that <laughs> in order to get, if we were to buy a building here in this area, the cost of, of purchasing uh, commercial land or businesses right now is astronomical. Um, so there's one that came up. Actually, you guys know where the World Mission is? Down on Burl uh, yeah, Burlingame. Uh, they went out of business. Nice big building. I'm like, hey, that may be a possibility. It's right close to where we're at. $1.65 million. So a couple of you, I thought about calling you up, see if you had any spare change. Help us out with that. <laughs> but I figured that may be a tall order. Yeah, that's a good buy. Yeah. Yeah, and they want 1.5 just for this building, this whole complex. It is worth it. That's the, that's the deal as far as even what we've got right here. If you do the dollars and cents per square foot, we're actually not doing too bad, uh, even renting it. But uh, with a church plant, you don't start off with a ton of money to start with. Generally, you start off with very, very little and build it up from there. Um, the Lord has been good to us, but continue to pray. All right. Uh, other requests that uh, you have that you'd like us to pray with you about, if you want to turn it over to the back there. Uh, these folks still will continue to pray for our monthly church prayer list. Uh, the Berdines uh, down in Nicaragua, uh, the Bridge to Recovery program is heavy on my heart right now. Just continue to pray. God is working in that area. Uh, I met a judge, one of our, our circuit judges here, uh, at a business meeting that we were having uh, for the local businesses on 28th Street. Uh, judge Timmer, I got a chance to talk with him, gave him the card and said, this is what we're looking to do. He gave it to the lead probationary officer in Wyoming County. They talked, uh, Brother Jamie, and he talked for like 45 minutes this afternoon, and the guy is like stoked. He wants us to, he says, exactly what he's been looking for. Uh, he wants to go ahead and pr promote that uh, to come here to this program. That's a blessing. Uh, you're not as excited as I am, but I, I was, if you heard me earlier, I, I yelped. Yeah, <laughs> I get excited, I get emotional. Uh, but that's what we've been praying for. And so the Lord is blessing that way. That's fantastic. All right, other requests that you have you'd like to pray, you can just pray with you? Yes. Okay. Okay. The foot surgery. You said when? Next Tuesday? Okay. Anyone else? Yes, Christina. Good. Just started Saturday. Praise the Lord. Glad to hear that. All right. I've been on the floor a lot, but usually because I fall down. <laughs> Sorry. Anyone else? I thought I saw another hand. Yeah. Walt. Meds. Okay. All right. Okay. Amen. Hope so. I'd ask you to pray for my dad, Larry Crawford. He is not doing well. Uh, he's been in ill health for quite a while. And uh, it's kind of funny. You see your dad as somebody that's always kind of, you know, that rock, that person you can always count on. Uh, my dad is just an incredible individual. My dad and mom are incredible people. And uh, godly people love the Lord. Just set a great example for me and my brothers. Um, but he has had some respiratory issues that haven't seemed to ever go away. So they are, are very concerned about that. And so just pray for my dad if you don't mind. Uh, he's going on 80 years old now. So. For some of you, that's still young. I won't say who they are, but... Anybody else? I can't do this. I'm sorry, guys. Family tells me I need to use this thing and prepare my back, but I'm kind of a walker. <laughs> I just can't get tough to sit. Let's have a word of prayer. We'll ask the Lord to watch over these, and then we'll get into our Bible study for tonight. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for today. Lord, we are so grateful and thankful to be in your house. Lord, what a beautiful thing it is to know that we can come to you in prayer and that you promise to not only just hear our prayers, but even to answer our prayers. This is what makes Christianity so unique. 
Lord, that we serve a God who hears and knows and cares about his people. So, Lord, I pray as we come to you in prayer, Lord, for some of these requests, Lord, I pray that your ear would be hearkened unto us. And, Lord, that you'd listen, Lord, to that which is in our hearts. Lord, I do pray that you'd be with my dad, watch over him as he is struggling to get well, Lord. He's had such a period of bad health for quite some time. Father, I pray that you'd be with my mom as well, Lord. Give her peace in her heart, Lord, as she continues to try to do what's best for him. And Father, I pray, Lord, that you would be glorified even in their illness. Father, I do pray also that you would be with Luke as he's going in for his next surgery. Lord, I do pray that uh, everything would go well. Lord, that you give the doctors the wisdom to do only that which is necessary and needful to be done. Lord, be with David as he is ill tonight, unable to be here with us. Watch over him and continue to be with Pat, Lord. Watch over her as she's getting some of her medications straightened around. Lord, I pray that you give the doctors the guidance they need. Lord, that they would be able to do what is important and necessary uh, to give her better health, Lord, through, whether through medicines or uh, other means. Father, I do thank you, Lord, for the church that you've given to us. Lord, what a blessing it is to be able to be here, Lord, as we search for a new building. Lord, even still, we pray, if it's your will for us to stay right here, that you'd make that openly apparent. And Father, I pray that you'd even provide the financing of what needs to take place, that we would be able to find the building that is best for us. Lord, but most importantly, Lord, that it can be a lighthouse here in this community. Lord, there are other churches here that serve you faithfully. Lord, I would never say that we are the only one, but I do have a burden. And I know the people of Crosspoint have a burden to be a lighthouse here. And so, Lord, I pray that you'd help us to accomplish that. Show us where we need to go, what we need to do. May you continue to bless our finances, Lord, so we're able to pay our bills. Lord, but also be able to put aside even extra money towards our building program so that we can get the financing together for a down payment. Father, I do once again ask you, Lord, that you would be with our missionaries, but especially the Berdeens, Lord, as they are missionaries to Nicaragua. Lord, as they minister there, Lord, I pray that you'd give them wisdom. I know that uh, it's a very poor country to begin with. The Lord, with all the recession and the, uh, the pandemic and things, Lord, has made it extremely difficult for the men that are there that are serving faithfully. Lord, I pray also that you would be with um, the recovery program, Bridge to Recovery, B2R. Lord, I pray you'd be with Jamie and Michelle. Lord, watch over them, build a hedge about their family. Lord, about their marriage as well. Lord, strengthen them, Lord, that they be able to accomplish that which you've laid out for them. Lord, Brother Jamie and I prayed for many, many times, Lord, many, many months as this program is getting off the ground. Lord, I pray that your will would be done. Guide me as the pastor of the church, Lord, to help Jamie. And Lord, I pray you continue to open doors here in our community. Father, of all the things, Lord, that we hope to accomplish, Lord, we need your Holy Spirit here in our church. Lord, it's not enough for us to be well-intentioned. It's not enough for us to simply have programs or have church. Lord, what we desire and what we need most is your Holy Spirit's guidance, wisdom, and Lord, your power that can change lives. Lord, we are going into an area that is oftentimes neglected and many times is without hope those that struggle with addictions, those that struggle with finding a way out of their cycle of addiction. And Lord, a program won't change that. It has to be your Holy Spirit. So Lord, I pray that you give us wisdom as we set this program up, that it may be effective here in this community. And Lord, that we would see souls saved for your glory. Lord, that we'd see families and marriages put back together. Lord, I know this is already what you desire, so Lord, I know that you're able to accomplish this. Lord, I don't know exactly how and why everything is going to work, but I know that it's your will for us to reach those that are in the highways and hedges and compel them to come in. So we are simply trying to do what your word calls us to do. And so we ask your Holy Spirit to bless the work of our hands, knowing once again the easiest prayers are those that are already known to be in your will. And we know according to your word that you're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Lord, break our hearts as a church. That as we see these things moving forward, Lord, that we would be burdened 
for those that are lost and without hope. And Lord, truly, as your word says, we stand between the living and the dead so oftentimes. Lord, help us to be burdened as a church. Help us to be compassionate and understanding of those that have needs. And Lord, I pray that you once again be with Jamie and Brother John and others who are in leadership positions there. Lord, give them direction. Father, thank you once again for the opportunity we have to study your word. May you watch over us, Lord. May you guide everything that we do, day, that we say and do, Lord. Let it be pleasing to you and beneficial to your church. In thy precious son's name we pray. All God's people said, amen. Can we shut that door completely, fellas? That'd be all right. All right. Uh, anybody got a lesson from last week? Who you need a lesson from last week? That means you don't have one for right now. <laughs> there you go. Uh, Brother Scott, before you sit down, is there, there should be some more on the table there. And then we need to give those out as well, right? Is that them? Uh, yeah, that'll be for next week. We can pass those out too. But um, yeah, Chris, you can go back on the table there. There should be a bunch of them on the table. Sorry, we're kind of a little scattered today. First uh, Corinthians chapter 1, though, in your Bible. If you have your Bible or if you have it on your phone, you ought to have your Bible on your phone too. Uh, I have a number of Bibles that are on my phone that I use. Uh, we use a King James here in our church. It's just, once again, continuity factor. What the kids are being taught in their class is the same that teens are being taught and that we're being taught. So we kind of all go out of the same book. Uh, so we use the King James, but I have uh, a number of... Yeah, let's go ahead. This is the one Scott in the, in the maroon there is passing out is next week's, and I'll explain to those that are new to my class kind of how this works. Brother Chris is going to pass out the ones that we're going to study tonight. So if you need those, Brother Chris here, the guy in the black, the man in black, not Johnny Cash, but this man in black, uh, <laughs> we'll pass it out to you. I'm not sure what I was saying earlier, but I'm, I'm sure it was important. Anybody remember? I don't know. All right, first, oh, I was talking about Bibles, having Bibles on your on your phone or on your iPad. Um, I use a lot, I use my Bible more electronically than I do with, I have my stayed and true Bible, the Bible I gave my life back to the Lord with 30 years ago that I still use. I use that oftentimes in my own personal study. Um, but I encourage you, if you don't have the Bible on your on your iPhone, Takarta is a really good Bible version. It's free, uh, and you can get a lot of that kind of extra free uh, commentaries and things along with it. Uh, eSword is also another real good one that I use for my computer. Uh, but uh, Takarta is one that's online. You can't really download it. It's it's You have an app for it, but uh, you can go ahead and read it. And they have another one. It's, called, it's uh, dramatized. Anybody ever hear one of those? Where some guy, like, they'll read through the Bible, and, like, when they're, <laughs> it talks about when they're in the boat, they'll have, like, the waves kind of crashing alongside and the wind going through. And if they're nervous or afraid, you'll have people in the background, background like, crying out or whatever else are nervous. Uh, I do that a lot of times if I'm walking, because I have to go walking for my heart situation. I have to go out and walk. I'll put my earbuds in and just listen to the dramatized version. Now, it's sometimes a little bit easier than just hearing the words being read. It's nice to be able to kind of get the, the surround effect. So like when a woman is speaking, they have a woman's voice, man speaking, a man's voice, uh, LGBTQ, I'm not sure what they do, but anyway. Uh, <laughs> but the uh, it'll have basically all these different added features. So it's called Dramatized, the Dramatized Bible, if you ever want to look that up. It's great to put on your phone. Uh, it's wonderful when you're working out or you're walking or even if you're mowing the grass, that kind of thing, uh, to have the Word of God constantly coming into you. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, we're going to look at verses 19 through 31 in our class. We've had a couple weeks of this. Um, those who have not been with us, I'll bring you quickly up to speed. The Corinthian church was uh, an incredible church. It was one of the biggest cities in Asia Minor, which we would consider uh, Greece today. Uh, it was a very influential church, um, or influential city when it came to trade. Uh, they had many different trade routes that came through, which allowed for them to have a lot of different people from different parts of the world come through. Um, they were an influential city. They were a philosophical type city, uh, but they were a very perverse city. Uh, they had temples. They, they were, their main worship in the uh, city of Corinth uh, was the goddess Aphrodite. And uh, that name probably rings for some of you that basically gets used even yet today. But she was the goddess of love. And so, and once again, they weren't talking about, I love pizza. They were talking about an eros, a, uh, a sensual kind of love. 
and uh, they had temples everywhere around the city. Uh, they had over 1,000 uh, temple prostitutes, men, women, children, that were there in the temples. And if you were going to uh, worship Aphrodite, you know, part of the whole process would be that you'd have a relationship with one of these temple prostitutes, and that was kind of consummating your worship that you had for that day or your, your, uh, your admiration as well as your uh, desire to be a good uh, worshiper of Aphrodite. And you can imagine, once again, if that's part of your society, that's the norm, how much difficulty it must have been for the Corinthians who accepted Christ to separate that. You understand what I'm saying? It had been incredibly difficult. And I often remind people when they talk about how our world's so wicked and it's impossible to serve God in, in this wicked world, I'm like, this is not the most wicked the world has ever been. It's been worse, trust me. Uh, read through scriptures and you find that to be true. He destroyed everything in the, in the diluvian flood because the, every, all of mankind, the only thought in their imagination was wickedness continually. Uh, but yet, once again, we find that in these different difficult times, there were still people that stayed true to the word of God and stayed true to their relationship with the Lord. And so when Paul establishes the Corinthian church, there's a year and a half that he spends here in this city. We can tend to look through the book of Acts, and in one chapter he was at Corinth, and then he went on too. We can tend to look at him, well, he was there for a couple of weeks and then decided to move on. He was there for a year and a half laboring. He was a tent maker by trade as well. Uh, so he met Apollo, um, Aquil and Priscilla, and they were also tent makers, and so he kind of threw in with their business to have funds and things for him to start the local church that was here in Corinth. Um, also, you'll find about the city of Corinth in the book of Corinthians, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, they were a very gifted church because they had such a high culture rate and had so many people coming through and were such an influential city. They had people that were extremely talented, but also people that had been tremendously gifted. And uh, the interesting thing that you find is along with the gifts, because we have certain denominations that put great emphasis on gifts. Uh, in the church, I think there are gifts that the church has given, but I think many times they're misused, and uh, there were some gifts that were meant to die with the early church that weren't meant for us today, such as speaking in tongues and faith healing and some of those kind of things. Um, but although they were so gifted in those areas, you also find they were the most corrupt of any of the New Testament churches that are written, that letters are written to. Uh, they are really messed up, and we're going to see that kind of as we go through the book of 1 Corinthians. Uh, but with all their gifts and all their, their wealth and all of their prestige, they also were so carnal uh, in their attitude when it came to the things of God. And so Paul had to come back here in 1 Corinthians and basically slice and dice them a little bit uh, and kind of set things in order. And once again, we need to be careful that we're not like them in some ways, where he that thinketh he standeth, take heed lest he fall. Uh, we all need to be careful of this. The more he blesses, the more he gives us, the more he requires. And we need to remember that. And so be mindful of that. In our class, basically, and I gave you two, you have two lessons there. Some that are there. Lesson three is the one we're going to discuss today. At the end of the lesson today, uh, hopefully when we have time here, um, I will uh, go through next week's lesson kind of in a bulleted form on lesson four. We'll kind of talk through that one. Uh, once we finish up here, and then I want you to take these uh, questions that are here at the bottom and work through them. Okay, so today, those that are new to my class, you can kind of just follow along. You can feel free to chime in if you'd like, if you have something to, to add. Uh, but the ones that we're going to go through in Lesson 4, we'll discuss it, what we're going to discuss next week. But you'll go home then and write out and fill in the questions about the, uh, the Lesson 4. And then when you get back next week, we'll discuss it. Uh, to start with. But for today, I want to kind of give you kind of a backdrop as we go through this. In our class, we have the key verse. I put a key verse every time. Key verse means it's important to the passage we're going through, but mostly it's because we ought to be memorizing Scripture. Not just for the kids, not just for the teens. Adults need to memorize Scripture. So this is your homework for next week. Okay? I want to ask how many of my class who generally come did their homework, uh, but you and Jesus know. 
So I encourage you, once again, take these verses, memorize them as do. So we will say the reference together, say the verse, and then say the reference again. 1 Corinthians 1, 25. Because the, hang on, hang on, we're not all there. All right, it's right on your notes there. We'll say the reference, the verse, then the reference one more time. Ready to go? 1 Corinthians 1, 25. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. 1 Corinthians 1, 25. It's a great verse, and once again, we'll be talking about this as we go through this, but God's wisdom is so much higher than what we are. And many times what gets in the way of our walk with the Lord is our thinker. I think, I think, I think, rather than simply having faith and trusting, trusting, trusting in what the Lord has for us. We looked at number one, Paul makes it clear that any, man, any of man's supposed wisdom is nothing considered to the wisdom of God. Amen, amen, amen. Uh, and he takes basically these verses 19 and 20 through 21 and talks about this. Verse 20, who is the, where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the, the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? We live in a day and age where we're so smart we don't need God. Right? We don't, our culture, our society doesn't need God anymore. We're smarter than that. And that's sad. Uh, because it affects every area of our thinking. Uh, and I just think sometimes when man begins to shake his fist at heaven and say, I'm, I know better than you, the angels must just laugh. And God himself must get a smirk and go, really? Huh? But we live in a day and age where that's true. Number two, to the carnal mind, the preaching of Christ is a stumbling stone, in particular to the Jews, and a laughing stock when you consider the Greeks. Verse 20 through 22 through 25, for the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them that are, which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Amen. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. You realize what Paul is saying here? He said, God at his most simplistic thought is so far above the wisest of human beings and he says here he said the the strongest nation is nothing compared to the power of our god and that once again should inspire us to say we have every reason to be on the offense rather than on the defense when it comes to our spiritual walk number three paul tells him to look around <laughs> And be reminded that the Lord saves the humble and the simple. He says, for you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God had chosen the foolish things of the world to confound, uh, foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God had chosen the weak things of this world to confound the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are that no flesh should glory in his presence. He says, look around in your church, and you're going to see that you're not too smart. <laughs> look around your church. God didn't get the cream of the crop many times when you look around the church. I'm talking any church. Uh, oftentimes, those are the most intelligent, those that are the most accomplished, those that have the most money don't need God. That's their attitude. I don't need that. But most of us, we wouldn't categorize ourselves in one of those areas. We'd have to say, I squeaked through high school and made it into college. Huh? Not the most athletic person in the world, not the person who has the most money in the world, but I need the Lord. And oftentimes, once again, having those things help us to realize how dependent we are upon the Lord for all these things. And I just find it ironic as they, had to be, they read these letters out loud to the church <laughs> When they got him, and he goes, Paul's like, look around. <laughs> he said, I've been there. I started that church. Look around. You think you're something. You're not. I just find that that's humorous. Uh, number four, he said, instead of boasting about who discipled them, remember we were talking at the beginning here? I'm of Paul. I'm of Apollos. I'm of Cephas. He says, it's not important. It's not important who discipled you. They should be reminded that it's the Lord that saves and keeps them. Verse 30 through 31. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. 
If you and I have accomplished anything in our Christian life, it's not because we're something special, but it's because we've humbled ourselves at some point in our life, and God has seen fit to use us and speak to us. And oftentimes, once again, when the blessings get big and God allows us to gain strength, churches and people forget God that brought them to that point. And that's why he says, no flesh should glory in his presence. He that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. So what we do in my class now, we have questions for tonight. I took a little bit of time because I wanted to bring everyone up to speed so you know kind of the direction we're going. Number one, why is the cross of Christ foolish to the worldly mind? And I want, if you're going to speak up, kind of just speak up loudly if you're going to answer this. But um, wh why do you think that is? Yeah. Sure. Why, why would you die for anybody else? Huh? Giving your own son to die for somebody else at that. I mean, I love you folks. I, Brother Josh, I love him. But if it came between you and T, I'll bring flowers to your grave. <laughs> I'll think of you quite often. But uh, you don't hold a candle. He's my son. God so loved the world that he gave. His only begotten. It's beyond the thinking of mankind. Anyone else? Yeah. Ed. Well, that's true. A lot of religions that, that preach that, teach that, denominations. You know, you got to help God out, right? Well, he loved you, he died for you, you ought to ask him to save you, but you got to be a good person to get to heaven. Yeah, Steve. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, if you look at, you look at the story, a Jew... 2,000 years ago, was put to death, and I'm supposed to trust that his blood is going to buy my eternity. Now, if you're an unsaved, faithless human being, what do you think about that? Foolishness, right? Your, creed, your, your cheese done slipped off your cracker. You, know, you, you lost something here. You, you probably showed up a Happy Meal. Yeah, you see, I, I see people, there's a couple of people that I think are pretty good at this. Um, David Jeremiah was good at this. There's a number of others that I, I uh, MacArthur is good at this. They're intellectual people, much more intellectual than I am. Uh, I went to college, but obviously not the same one they did. Uh, but these are really intelligent people. But sometimes you see Christians trying to explain in human terms the salvation message so that people will understand it. The unsaved world will never comprehend that. That's why it requires faith. That's why Jesus said, if I, even I, be lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. We can't rationalize it out for pe human beings to say, okay, intellectual, this is how this all works. There's far too much faith that's involved there. Faith that a virgin conceived, stop right there. That's foolishness, right, to the world. Some of you look confused. Uh, a virgin can't have a child. All right? So to say that Mary, before she was married to Joseph and was a virgin, was conceived in the Holy Ghost and the Son of God was placed in her womb. Tell me that doesn't sound nuts. Huh? And then he grew up to 33 and the religious leaders of his day crucified him. And then three days later, what happened? You're crazy. <laughs> People don't get up after being crucified and gutted. They put a spear into his side and punctured his lungs and his heart. He wasn't mostly dead. He was all dead. Three days later, he pushed a stone away and climbed out. Sure. I get annoyed with that. Do you get annoyed with that? 
billions and billions and billions of years ago, there was this loud boom. Everything began to fall into place. <laughs> and then the world, there was a little amoeba. Started to swim around there and all the gases and water that was there and decided he wanted to swim. So he grew a tail over billions of years. And then he needed some legs because he was tired of swimming around. So he started to sprout legs and that took millions of years. Then he crawled out. He realized he needed to breathe. So it changed his whole out, his inside so he could breathe air. And you guys how crazy that sounds? But, we, but you look in our society, that's the truth to them. That's absolute truth. Once again, when they look at our faith, they have a similar thing. Anybody else? Why is the cross of Christ foolish to the worldly mind? Let me say this. I think they've been confused by countless religions and denominations as well. Ever been asked this question? What makes you think that you have the truth? People ask you that? Start talking about your faith? What makes you think you've got it? Who do you think that makes the happiest with all the confusion, the spiritual confusion? Satan himself, doesn't it? He's a master counterfeiter. He loves that. Because in all that confusion, people lose sight of the gospel, the cross of Jesus Christ, are essential for salvation. Anybody else? Go to the next one. Let me throw this out to you. Can a person accept the truth of the gospel and yet be still be a cynic of the gospel? Okay. How so? Let me ask you this, because I, I, you're right on where I'm trying to get to. Can someone be, accept Jesus Christ as death, by resurrection, and trust him as Savior, but not believe he's virgin born? Because our human mind says that's an impossibility. Huh? Or if they believe in other things, but yet when it comes down to, really, you believe in three days, three nights, he came up out of the grave? I, I can believe that I want a better life, so I'm going to pray this prayer and receive Christ, but... That's kind of crazy. Can, a, can someone have both? Okay. Anybody else add to that? Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Is that where our society, even Christendom, is at today? There, there are Bible colleges that don't believe that we have the Word of God. You know, so can they be cynical of the whole truth, but yet still say, I'm a Christian? That's where, that's where I'm kind of getting to. Okay. People can believe it. Don't make it true. You don't think so? What, is, what are the essentials for salvation? Because we're talking about the cross of Christ. That's the, the, the essence of it. How, how does a person get there? Yeah, Junior. Okay. Yeah, believe it. That's where I'm going with this. Good. What is it? What do we call that? If you believe and trust in something like that. Faith. Is faith essential? And that's where he's saying, if you don't believe part of it, can you believe the rest of it? We have churches and denominations that are trying to do that now. You know, we believe he was born, but it's just kind of crazy to think that he rose from the dead. Well, wait a minute. You, you can't pick and choose. If God is not strong enough and powerful enough to speak the world into existence, what does that mean about salvation? 
You know, so people will discount this part. Well, I, I don't really believe that, you know, the whole Red Sea thing. Come on. Who's going to believe that? That a wind came all night, blew a hole in the Red Sea, and they walked through a dry ground, and they got to the other side. Pharaoh's army's chasing them, and he goes over and puts his rod over it, and it comes back together and drowns them all. Yeah, Chris. Yeah, what parts are true and what parts Yeah. And I, I've had people, they'll ask me this, and they'll be wondering about that. Yeah, Joe. I believe Nicodemus accepted Christ. He was there at the crucifixion. He's there at the uh, the burial. Um, but yeah, John chapter 3, he asks all sorts of questions, doesn't he? How can a man enter into his mother's womb a second time? <laughs> What's he saying? That's foolish. That's what, that's what he's trying to say. That's ridiculous. It's impossible. And that's what Jesus gives the great discourse of separating spiritual and physical. Right? Uh difference between the water and the blood kind of thing and then of course comes to verses 15 16 and 17 that are just so powerful but i believe nicodemus accepted christ i do i think he was cynical sure he was a he was a well-educated man to ask him to believe these things was difficult for him to grasp but i don't believe he would have been there at the burial if he hadn't accepted christ at some point my point and that's, i know where you were coming from i think people can be cynical but I don't think they can stay cynical and still have faith. I, I just think those things can be diametrically opposed. Now, to how much, to what extent? You know, when you lead someone to Christ, I lead someone to Christ, I don't ask them that they believe every story. They haven't even heard every story. They've never studied every story that's in there. But I always come back to the Word of God. I'll show them the Bible. I said, this is not my word, but His word. That's where I start. Because if they won't accept that premise... There's no point in going forward because everything else I'm going to tell you, I'm going to say, well, that's just your opinion. So I'd love to say, well, yeah, you know, cynical people are many intellectual people talk themselves right out of salvation because they're unwilling to accept something by faith that's miraculous. And that's why Paul is saying this when he comes to them. He says, you know what? I came preaching the word of the, the cross of Christ to you. I didn't come and talk about everything else. I started with the basic building block of faith. This is where we all have to start. Number two, is it all dangerous to try to intellectualize the salvation experience? And then kind of where does this take place in our society today? Colleges? Where else does this take place? Sunday school? How about the Internet? They say it on the internet. It's got to be true. You know, they, they wouldn't lie to you. Yeah, I, you want to write down some verses here. I put salvation and faith go hand in hand. Mark chapter 5, verse 34. Jesus is talking to the woman with the issue of blood that touched his hem of his garment. He said, daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Not your actions. Your faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. If I could see it, it's not faith. It's when I don't see it that it requires faith. Luke 17, verse number 19. So to him, arise, go thy way. Thy faith hath made thee whole. And once again, what is faith? Hebrews 11, 1 through 3. I just quoted it a second ago. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it, the elders obtained a good report. He's talking about those in the Old Testament, their faith. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. So what is he saying? God doesn't believe in evolution because that's what he's talking about here. The things that we see were made, he said, things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. 
He's contradicting that intellectualism that's taken over our humanistic society. But it is dangerous. We have to be careful. And I've seen people, even when they grow in their faith, and they start reaching out and trying to get more and more information, and they end up straying into, uh, straying, straying into wild oats, places where they shouldn't be, and before long, they're hooked. The intellectual side gets in, and they realize, well, that, that's ridiculous to believe that. And so they get kind of quieter and quieter until they confirm that, well, that must be the truth. Yeah. 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 Now you may believe that. I didn't believe that, though. No. <laughs> we have to church Daryl when we're finished here. <laughs> I know you hear about it. Yeah. Aliens came here and built the pyramids. <laughs> Aliens came here. Like, yeah. John. Sad. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's sad. It happens. You need to be very careful what you read, what you listen to. Make sure that the Word of God is what you balance it with. And if it comes between Dr. So and so or the Word of God, choose the Word of God. Because even if you say, well, that's not possible, that's the point. It's not possible for a man to be born in a, in, in a virgin's womb. I know, that's the point. If it was possible, it's not God. It would be made of men. Yeah, Junior. Here's a good one. Follow the science. You ever hear that? <laughs> follow, follow the science. Because science has always been right. <laughs> huh? Let's bleed him. Get all the bad blood out and then he'll survive. The guy's sick as it is. The Bible says the life of the body is in the blood. That's pretty common sense. Science has been wrong too many times for me to simply say I'm going to trust the science. Anyway, that's a whole other thing. Number three, why is Christ crucified a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Greeks? He uses these two separate words. Why, why do you think that is? Yeah, yeah. Jeanette, I'm sorry. This is your Messiah. Well, for years, they'd waited for the descendant of King David to sit on the throne of Israel again and throw off the Roman legions and make Israel a, a one nation again, independent. No. Okay. Yeah, Junior.
to them. It, yeah, they were very much into the logic. Right. Anybody think of a time when that happened? The book of Acts? Mars Hill. Exactly right. Acts chapter 17, 18 through 21. <laughs> they grabbed Paul and they said, what will this babbler say? He seemed to set forth strange gods because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. Uh, they wanted to figure it out. Took him to Mars Hill and said, hey, tell us what you, what you need to say here. And then verse 21 says, for the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. Plato, Socrates, all these different uh, philosophers, these great philosophers came out of Greece. So to them, yeah, what's foolishness we've been talking about? The Jews are stumbling block. Think of all the things that the Jews had. You ever think about that? The Old Testament scriptures, the prophecies. What did they know? Okay, well, I'm saying, what do they know about their Messiah? What things in particular were prophesied? <laughs> Where he's going to be born. Huh? Matthew chapter 2, right? Herod says to the Pharisees and Sadducees, the scribes, where is this Messiah supposed to be born? Did they know? Sure. They tell them in Bethlehem of Judea. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Anything else? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Did the Jews believe that? What did the Jews believe when Jesus said that? He said, destroy this temple and I'll raise it up in three days. He's standing there in front of the temple. The physical temple. <laughs> it took years for us to build this. You know, and this carpenter is saying, tear it down, I'm going to build it up again. Three days. Yeah, right. Oh, sure, he could have. Huh? That's, how did that cause them to stumble then? using the physical and the spiritual, going back to what kind of king or messiah they were looking for. Huh? Cause them to, what do you think about when something's a stumbling block? What is a stumbling block? There has to be something there. You ever try to go through the room and the lights are off? Because you want to save electricity or you just like the idea of seeing if I can go through this without having the lights on? few uh, Legos later and stub toes and everything else, you're like, why didn't I turn the light on? So you're hopping around upside down and holding your foot. <laughs> something is so, it's something that's there. They should see it and see it for what it is, but they stumble over it. The Jews had the truth of their Messiah and of their God right there in their hands, but it became religion-based instead of faith-based. And that's why Hebrews 11, the passage I started to talk about, read through the entire chapter. All Paul does is go back and say, by faith, by faith, by faith, by faith, by faith. Who's that letter written to? The Jews. It's a letter to the Hebrews. Paul said, this becomes such a stumbling block to you, you don't even realize that you hold that truth, but yet you're falling over it every time. Just accept it. By faith, you have the truth. See, if you go back deeper, I keep going here. If you go back deeper, they even knew when Jesus was going to be born. Now, think about this. They knew when he was going to be born, the, the weeks that he talks about in the book of Daniel. They knew almost, I mean, within a I mean, short window, they knew exactly when that Messiah was going to come. And they knew where he was going to come. Now, stop and think about this. Why didn't they have that place staked out? <laughs> that would make sense, wouldn't it? If the guy you've been waiting for centuries for, you knew within a few years where he was going to be born, and you knew where he was going to be born in, in Bethlehem, man, why wasn't somebody there checking every kid that came through? Huh? It's one of these kids. Let's keep tabs on them. Even if they believed it was to throw off the Romans at that point, well, you think they would, but they didn't. Why? 
because religion became important to them. And their religion was their stumbling block. They couldn't get past it because it was so important. Look at the story of Peter, right? Rise up and eat, right? Sees all the unclean beasts. What does he say? <laughs> Not so, Lord. God's talking to him. He's still telling God, no, 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 wait. You can't tell me to eat those unclean beasts because I've never done that. Peter, Jew, stop stumbling over that which is there. But that's how they were. Yeah, quickly. Who did? No, I don't, they didn't believe it themselves, I don't think, unfortunately, even though they knew it, because uh, even it took the Romans a long time to come around. Um, but it's a good idea. Number four, can you think of times in the Bible where he talks about the foolishness of God is wiser than men? Give me some illustrations of that in the Bible. Just quickly, one word answers or Okay. Balaam's donkey, I love that story. Right? Donkey turns around and answers, why are you beating me? I've been saving your life. Angel's up there ready to kill you. Now, I don't know about you, but if my little dog Max, if he starts talking to me while I'm getting home, time to go in and get checked out. Hmm? My wife doesn't believe that. She still talks to him like he's a human being. Max, are you hungry? Do you want to go outside? <laughs> he doesn't speak English. All right. Anything else? Give me some other Bible stories quickly. Gideon. Huh? Gideon. 300 against all those people, and they won. Sarah and Abraham. Old and they're in their, getting a child at their age. Amazing. Sure. That doesn't make sense. David and Goliath. Jonah and the whale. Hear about the little kid that was in school and the teacher was saying that's not true. And she said he said, Well, I'll have to ask Jesus when I get there if that's true. And she said, well, What if you don't make it to heaven? She said, Then you'll have to ask him down the other place. Right. Ten plagues. The flood. And there's so many things, once again, the faith has to be there to believe it. They're not just stories. They actually happened. God intervened miraculously many times. All right, number five. What are some of the foolish and weak things that the Lord might use to humble the earthly wise and the mighty of our day? A man thinks he's so powerful, so wise. What does God do to make him humble? Okay. Okay. Yeah, the ship that won't, it, it, it's unsinkable. Yeah, God can't sink this ship. Talk about a wrong challenge. Huh? Nebuchadnezzar? That's another one of my favorites. I'm a visual kind of guy, so I love those stories. <laughs> Out there like an oxen on his hands and knees eating grass. Huh? Okay, let's, let's stay on track here because I'm going to let you, you're short on time. But what are the foolish and weak things? How would knowing that cause us to be humbled? I think the more he knows, let me just, I'll give you where you're going. The more he knows, the more we see the human eye, the brain, all these things, it couldn't have just happened. It's an impossibility. I actually have wished that evolution were partially true. I'd have kept the tail. A little monkey tail coming out? That would have been helpful. Huh? I wouldn't have to have my kid hold the la the flashlight. I just throw it in my tail, stick it over here. Be awesome, huh? <laughs> yeah, it's like man, they almost had me. <laughs> Somebody messed up. All right, uh, I think science. Once again, when you know science, God just humbles man. The weather, yeah, man, he can control everything. But what happens? Hurricane Ian hits. 
And all of a sudden, the power and majesty of God gets brought, brought into focus. I remember I was, <laughs> years ago, I remember Bill Clinton after one of the <laughs> hurricanes came through, a tornado came through and ripped through the south. He said, we're going to spend more money so that something like this never happens again. I'm like, I remember when I heard that, I'm like, typical politician that thinks throwing money at the problem is going to help it. Uh, I got news. You're not going to stop tornadoes. Yeah, Steve. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Lo and behold, they find it. For years, they ridiculed they ridiculed biblicists about the Hittites. There was no such thing as the Hittites. Those are my age or above. You remember this when it came out. And lo and behold, they found the Hittites. But they spent years ridiculing. Well, if the Hittites were really there, there would be, there'd be things about them all over the place. <laughs> you just haven't dug in the right place yet. The Bible is not a history book, but it's historically correct. The Bible's not a science book, but it's scientifically correct. And over and over again, I think God brings those things to light just to make us look foolish. When we think we have control over things, and the Lord goes, not so fast. Yeah, Scott. Sure. And that humbles us. That keeps us humble. You know, you're, until a number of years back, they didn't even know about DNA. That's, you know, I mean, literally back in the 18s and early 1900s, you had doctors that refused and ridiculed the idea of having to wash your hands between patients. It was why I forget the guy's name now that he he I mean, went in the scientific community and among surgeons and said, wash your hands, wash your hands before you go into the next person. You're taking the disease, the bacteria, from one and giving it to the other. That's why they're all dying. They mocked him. They ridiculed him. I'm talking about the science of his day. Laughed at him to the point he went crazy and died in an insane asylum because nobody could see a bacteria. So that's just this lunatic talking about that. Obviously, that's not true. Science doesn't, doesn't prove that. And then all of a sudden, you wouldn't find a doctor going today into a surgery and not masked up, gowned up, and with his gloves on and scrubbing all the way up to his elbows to make sure he doesn't pollute anything that's in there. The Lord's sitting back scratching his head and going, what? You don't think you should wash your hands when you're going from patient to patient to patient? Let me give you one other thing I wrote down. Catastrophes, but in particular, think about 9-11. I think most of we're alive either teens or adults at that time, you can remember where you were when you watched the planes slamming into those buildings. Remember the attitude of God's, of God's people as well as the United States of America after that happened? The churches were packed. Churches, I remember our church I was at in Missouri, left the doors open. It was a steady stream of people coming in to pray. I think, once again, when we get all high and mighty and think we've accomplished something, all it takes is one disaster to bring us back to our knees. Number six here. What, in, what ways, in what ways can we glory in this life regarding our Christianity? And what are the cautions that a Christian should be careful of in this? No flesh should glory in his presence. He that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Okay, how do we do that? Yeah. Give God the credit. Anything else? How about this? If God can use me, he can use anybody. How many other amens are out there? Huh? If God can use you, he can use anybody. An old preacher got up one time and he says, if you knew the man I was, you wouldn't take the time to sit and listen to me. And he said, if I knew the people you were, I wouldn't waste my time. <laughs> huh? We're nothing special. Once again, Paul says, look around, right? <laughs> look around your church as we're reading this. Are there any rich people, any wealthy people, any intellectual people, any Nobel Prize winners in here? Or we're just a simple salt of the earth people. 
that have the simple faith to say, Lord, I trust you. Anything else? How, else can a Christian, how can a Christian make sure that he doesn't take any of that glory for himself? Because it can be easy sometimes when we're talking to people about faith is to go act as so somehow we've accomplished something. Well, Theron, you just think you have the truth. Yeah, Chris. In what ways? You're right. I agree. What do you think? Yeah. yeah. I think sometimes when we're Christians, the Lord's cleaned us up and maybe used us in some areas, and we've accomplished some things for the Lord, and we forget that the guy who stumbles in off the street is just as capable of God changing his life as he did yours. And if not careful, we do. We worship self. I'm, well, I'd never do that, or... I'm better than they are. Yeah, but by the grace of God. And all of us are capable of that, by the way. Thinking we're better than we actually are. Thinking somebody else isn't, well, I don't know if the Lord can save them. He <laughs> saved you. He saved me. I had three years of my life that I didn't darken the door of church as a young man. Refused to go to church. Angry at God. There's not a Sunday that goes by that I don't thank God that he uses me. Because truthfully, I'll be honest with you, I don't deserve that. There's a lot of people that went down the road I went and either disqualified themselves from ministry or are still away from the Lord. But by the grace of God. And I think all of us, really, if we were to admit that, would say, yeah, there's some turns. I'm glad I made the right, right direction. But I could have very easily made the wrong one. Amen? Yeah. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Yeah. Anybody else? How else can we make sure we give God the glory? I'm going to throw one out here. It's going to sting a little bit. You ready? When somebody says, hey, what do you got to praise God for? It shouldn't be crickets. I've been in services where it's like that. I've even done it in my class a few times. <laughs> Let's try it. What do you have to be thankful for? Salvation, breath, good breath, yeah. <laughs> clothes, food, family, fellowship, place to live, roof over your head, your health, <laughs> lose your health and you find out how valuable it is. Have you ever been so sick that you're like, oh, I remember when I felt well, why didn't I enjoy that? <laughs> I've been that sick before. I'd give anything to feel like I did two weeks ago. Huh? Let's make sure that we say, you know what, by the grace of God, huh? to his glory. I'm not anything special. This church isn't anything special. But he is something special and has chosen to use earthen vessels to bring about victory. Amen? Let's bow for prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for today. Thank you, Lord, for the time we've been able to